Hello, I'm Carol Ann Riddell, and this is Science and You. School is out, but that doesn't mean the learning has to stop. Today, we bring you a show full of stories about kids and how we can hook them into the fun of science. For instance, if you've ever wondered how a figure skater spins so quickly or why tennis balls are fuzzy, science has some answers for you. We sat down with Sean Connolly, author of the book of wildly spectacular sports science, to learn more. Watching figure skaters can be dizzying as they move from fast to almost unimaginable speeds on the ice. So how do they do it? With the help of science, author Sean Connolly explains angular momentum. The, the speed increases depending on the width of the circle that's, that's rotating. So the figure skater will start off with his or her arms, not necessarily out fully, but, but out a bit. So in other words, the diameter of the, the rotating circle is about here. As they draw their hands closer and they get very tight at the very end, that diameter has become very much smaller and the speed increases correspondingly. Connolly's The Book of Wildly Spectacular Sports Science tackles the physics and physiology of athletics, examining questions from why pitchers raise their legs to the reasons some swim strokes are faster than others. And it includes hands-on experiments for kids to bring the science home. Let's go back to our figure skating example. We get a swivel chair, like an office chair, <laughs> and uh, we get... The, the child, the, the, the willing uh, volunteer to sit in it, willing. They, everyone's <laughs> willing, and they hold a weight or might be a heavy book in, e in either hand and hold it out and then someone else or a couple of people get the, the, the chair spinning and spinning and then the child will pull his or her arms together and the spinning will just really take off. That sounds fun. Same principle. We told you we'd dig into why tennis balls are fuzzy, so here you go. Sean says it boils down to friction. It's the string that bites against the furry outside of the ball briefly, just enough to kickstart the spin going like that. Mm -hmm. So if the ball didn't have that fur, if it were just smooth rubber, it would sort of skid off as if it were ice and it wouldn't have the same effect. We got to see this experiment up close. Using a balloon, Sean shows us why discus throwers spin around first. One of the chapters in the book has to do with discus throwers and why they do that funny kind of wind up where yeah. they go around and around, building up a kind of circle rather right. than throwing it overhand or like a frisbee. It's a heavy thing, a discus, so you need yeah. a, a bit of help. That's where the science comes in. We've got a hexi nut inside this balloon. You can sort of right. see it and hear yeah, it. I see it. Okay. Yep. You can do it with a coin as well. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just do a little bit of a circle here. It begins to roll around, but soon you'll start to hear something as well as see it as it rolls. And it's building up energy. It's a kind of audio version of the energy that's building up. And the faster that the discus thrower rotates, like the faster I'm moving it here, you can almost hear the energy there, really. It's, yes. it's a great sort of cue. And it's building up and up and up. Now, what I won't do is pop the balloon. But if I were to do <laughs> well, that, <laughs> if I were to do that, it would be the equivalent of the discus throw it letting go. Because it, that's when the, the circular motion would turn into linear motion. Do you think people realize how much science actually goes into sports? I don't think they do. And I think people also have the idea that the fun all resides in the sports and not in the science. So I think that the whole notion of breaking down that barrier is really important for me. Now we're really going to have some fun. Joining us is Jessica Garrett, one of the co-authors of OIC, 114 Experiments Guaranteed to Gross You Out. Did I get that right? You did. So clearly the gross out thing is a big factor here. Was that an obvious way to kind of pull kids into science? It is. I mean, you have to meet kids where their interest lies. And Good point. they are interested in what happens with their own body. Yeah. And they're very curious about why does my body do certain things? Why does it do some stinky things? And why won't grown-ups <laughs> talk to me about it? So they want to learn all about it. No, that's very interesting. Now, I understand that you, uh, you're one of your co-authors is your husband. Yes. And your son, Felix, was a willing participant in all this slimy stuff you did. Not so willing, not so willing. actually. <laughs> no, Felix does not like to touch slimy things, and he actually would gag at some of the experiments. So we knew that they were guaranteed to gross you out yeah. because he was that's gagging. That's excellent. Well, so you could live <laughs> up to that guarantee. Exactly. All right, well, let's get to our first experiment here, which we're excited about. We're going to build a burp factory never before in the history of science and you. <laughs> So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's get to it. All right, so 
We're gonna make a stinky burp factory, and here I have a bottle that mm -hmm. I'm gonna add some vinegar to. So I'm gonna add about a quarter a cup of vinegar. Got you it. You don't have to be exact with your me measurement, but there we go. We're gonna pour that in. Oh, let's use a funnel. That'll funnel make helps. It a little less messy. So we've got some vinegar here. We've got garlic going in here. No. Yep. Kids could choose whatever stinky thing they have lying around the house, some onions perhaps, mm -hmm. or maybe they could try some um, oils that their parents have, Okay. Um, like orange oil or cinnamon oil. Those wouldn't be quite as stinky. Right. But let's see, you know what? Our balloon broke, so we're just gonna Okay, let's try another one. This, one. You know, this is how we learn in science. Yeah, exactly. There we go, tap that in. Now, this is not gonna be exactly how a burp forms in your body because- <laughs> Good to know. Yeah, because a burp usually is because you've swallowed some air. So it's called aerophagia. Uh -huh. And usually it's just, we just swallow air as we talk, especially yeah. if we're talking while we eat. And yeah. it, gets, it goes down our esophagus and then oh, no. comes back up. Comes back, I'll hold this. Or if you've drunk some carbonated beverage, which mm -hmm. might have been in this before, that could come up too. Now this is an important part of it where you have to leave the balloon you leave to the, the balloon side to at the first, side, right? Yeah, so okay. we've got our vinegar in the bottom with our stinky garlic, we've uh -huh. got our baking soda here, and we're now we're going to dump it in okay. and watch what happens to our little balloon. <laughs> that is surprising. <laughs> it is surprising. <laughs> so the chemical in the chemical reaction, carbon dioxide gas was created, and you can see it's filling up this balloon. Now I'm hoping that some of the stinkiness of that garlic will have also gone up into right. this gas because now we have trapped a burp and now we can go over to our bigger brother, yes. someone we want yes. to annoy and we or can me, or have your... a little sniff. What do you think? Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> That is a stinky burp factory. That is for real. That You know what, that one really worked. It did. That really worked, wow. So let me ask you a serious question on this front. I mean, this is obviously fun. It's fun yeah. for us. Um, but what, as a, as a science educator, I yeah. mean, how important is it to make this stuff fun for kids? I mean, are we doing a good enough job of really getting kids engaged in this early enough? I think as early as possible. You mm -hmm. know, I think kids in kindergarten or even preschool, they are ready to be scientists. They're so interested in why the world works the way it does. And so I think science should be started right away, not, not waiting until there's a kind of a science subject to study maybe in sixth grade. I think they should start early. And I've been traveling all over the country doing the book tour for this book. Yeah. And everywhere I go, I say, who likes science here? Every hand. You is can up. really tap into their natural curiosity yeah. at that stage, I think, yeah. right? Yeah, they're so curious. All right, well, that is terrific. We've got lots more to come, so everyone's going to want to stick around. Thanks so much, Jessica. Sure. Science can be fun even for the youngest children. SciTech Kids, the brainchild of Kim Magloire, or better known as Dr. Kim, is a program designed to build little scientists by showing kids how exciting science can be. We have to count to three. One, One two, two, three. three. See what happens. Whoa. Whoa. What is that? <laughs> what is that? What do you think it is? A chemical reaction. A chemical reaction. Excellent. I established SciTech Kids for my daughter who love science, but I didn't feel there were enough activities beyond museums for kids. Mainly, um, a lot of the more innovative things are for older children, and from what I looked at, people assumed young kids could not learn scientific concepts. Uh, so they were more observers, but not participants. And as I began to do my own little study, I saw that kids could learn a lot if they're given the opportunity. So today we're going to make, anybody likes potions? Ooh, well guess what? A scientist called a chemist makes potions. When they're young, science is fun because they're exploring, they're curious. It's so important for our kids to be exposed to science because we live in a society where science and technology are becoming more important. People have been worrying about the English and the math, but in terms of science, there are countries that are way ahead of us, and there's no reason for that and we're not incorporating as much of the innovation to make it exciting. So it's really important, I think, at a young age, before they get too caught up in school, that we, we don't want the doors to be closed, that they think, oh, I'm not qualified, I'm not capable, uh, or I'm not exceptional in this area. 
One, two, three. <laughs> we cover the full range of STEAM. So if someone comes here for our 12-week program, they will literally have 12 different topics. So physics, chemistry, biology, uh, robotics, uh, engineering. So they'll build bridges. Um, so they really each week come in and they're curious to see what type of scientists they're going to be that week. It has to be authentic science or STEM so that they walk out of here and they're able to share that information with their parents. But we also want them to walk out of here and feel that it was exciting. And if they can keep even a little of that excitement when they go on to school, even when things become a little tougher, they won't be as distracted by that. Grown up opens a bottle of, of soda. What do you hear? It's the same sound that you hear here. But well, that's what one time my sister uh -huh. shake um, something that I was going to drink and then it exploded in the sink, but there was some more that I could drink. Well, do you know why that happened? That's a very good point. Do you know why that happened? Somebody shook the bottle. And when you shake the bottle and then you open it, it's like an explosion. I'm always amazed what, come out, what comes out of kids' mind, uh, mouths. So there are, every time it's exciting because there's always something new that they're going to tell you. Whether I thought that looked like cotton candy or why did it you know, explode or... Uh, so it's never, it's, it's always interesting to see science or STEM through the eyes of a child and have that aha moment when you see that aha moment when they get it. And Jessica is back with us. So you've got an experiment that can give us a pretty good sense of the Earth's layers, if I yes. understand it correctly. Yeah, so we wanted to include some geology in this book, yeah. too. We wanted to make sure there was biology and engineering and geology and chemistry and physics. Great. Covering all of the topics. So this is about geology. So let's make an earth parfait. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this cup and we are going to pour in a half cup of dish soap. Okay. So maybe you want to get started on that. Okay, I'll do that. that in. And then meanwhile, I'm going to mix a half a cup of water with a cup of blue food coloring. Okay, I'm qualified to do the dish soap, I think. <laughs> yeah. Do you want me to go ahead right, and pour go that ahead in and pour or wait? Pour that in, yep. Okay. Do I tilt this or just pour it you in straight? You can just pour it straight in. Just pour it straight in, yeah. okay. There we go. All right, great. Applause, please. <laughs> there we go. So this dish soap is actually gonna represent the inner core of okay. the earth. And now here I've got our water with some blue food coloring. Got it. And I'm going to slowly and gently pour this down the side, and hopefully it won't mix too much. Yep. There we go. So we can see up. So they mixed a little bit, but you can start to see that the water is actually sitting on top of that right. dish soap. Yes, okay? I see that. And does that, uh, does it get more that way as time goes yeah, by? Yeah, yeah. As, as, as we go, we'll see it separates more Got and it. more. So that water's floating on top of the dish soap. Okay. Okay, and then we're going to add a cup of vegetable oil. Okay. You want to do that? All right. A cup of vegetable oil. So the water is representing the outer core. The dish soap is the inner core. This um, vegetable oil is going to represent the mantle, okay. which is the thickest layer of the Earth's um, layers. Okay. So we'll dump this in, and so we'll, again, we're going to tilt, and hopefully I don't spill everywhere. Whoops, I'm spilling everywhere. <laughs> That's okay. Science That's is right. messy. That's right. <laughs> this book isn't called Gross You Out for Nothing. That's right. So Nobody promised to keep everything clean. There we go. Exactly. And I apologize to parents everywhere. Things are going to get messy, but, things, but there's going to be a lot of laughing and learning, too. So now we've got our mantle in there, and you can see the oil is floating on top of the water. Yeah, that really, that really does soap. demonstrate it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then the final layer, uh, here we go, of the earth is the earth's crust. And we're going to represent that with some rubbing alcohol. So we're just going to put a tablespoon. And this would be the lightest. This is the lightest, right. yeah. Um, there, I'm making more of a mess. Mm -hmm. Excellent. OK, come on. There we go. And would you pop in just yeah. a drop of red okay. food coloring, just so it shows up better? Okay. Not that the Earth's crust is red everywhere. Right. But we want to be able to distinguish the layers, I guess. There right? we go. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. And hmm, we may need to stir that, that a around bit. a little bit. 
Here, why don't we just, yeah, that's a good idea. There we go. <laughs> that's another scientific thing. We have to improvise. You have to improvise. Right. Use what you have, yep. And then we will pour this down the side. Let's see. So there. keep pouring it down the side. Does that help to create the layers? Yeah, if you pour it straight in, they'll all mix together. But eventually they will separate out. But doing it slowly and carefully means that, there we go, that rubbing alcohol will flow Wow, that looks very cool. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, and so these actually separate because they have different densities. So talk to me yeah. about density. Yeah. What is that, what is, what's the principle that we're understanding right. here? Yeah, so density, it's a comparison of the mass of an object mm -hmm. versus its volume. So it. It, the mass is how much matter it has inside of it, like how many atoms and molecules it has, right. and the volume is how much space, space it, takes it takes up. up. So okay. we're comparing the mass to how much space it takes up. And um, items that are more dense have more matter packed into them. So I brought, as a little demonstration for you, two things that, have the, that are the same size. Okay. But here's this pebble, and here's a cotton ball. The pebble has more matter in it, it's more dense. And likewise, this dish soap is more dense than the water, which is, again, more dense than the vegetable oil and, again, more dense than the uh, rubbing alcohol. Wow. And so the rubbing alcohol is literally floating on top of them because there's less matter in there per volume. Very yeah. cool. And it's really cool. This, you can imagine the Earth's layers like this because when the Earth was forming 4.5 billion years ago, and it was just a whole bunch of molten rock. As it cooled, the more dense materials went to the core, went to the center of the Earth, and the less dense materials are on the crust, which is where we oh, live. That, well, that really demonstrates yeah. it. Yeah. That's terrific. All right, thank you so much, and we've still got one more. Okay, okay. great. Thanks, Jessica. Technology is another great way to immerse today's digital kids in science. Mike Gilliam introduces us to some students who are getting a first-hand look at what it takes to build something that responds to commands and completes tasks. That's right, we are talking robots. It's, it's a, a varsity sport for the minds. Um, and, and so you have the opportunity to come and, and flex maybe uh, you know, the, the most important muscle of your brain. Mike Sereni isn't talking chess. These people have all gathered at the Armory in Washington Heights for the regional round of the first robotics competition. And it's aimed at smart middle school and high school students. Who created this? Dean Kamen, which is the um, founder of the Segways. So he started this program because he wanted to have some type of competition for the mind instead of focusing. You know, we have um, sporting events and we have the Final Four, our March Madness. This is kind of the March Madness of the minds. Students are challenged to form teams at their schools or through other programs in their communities and then build one robot per team that will compete against other teams for $16 million in scholarships. So what happens is you get the game, initially a goal, what you want your robot to do, and you have six weeks to create the robot. So when you get to the competition, you need to achieve your goal. And each game has a goal. So this, this year's goal is to focus on creating a solid shooter and creating a climbing mechanism. So those are the two main things you need to do. The robots don't look anything like humans or what you would see on Westworld. Here, they're shooting balls into a hopper, placing large plastic gears into another area, and climbing. To start, every team gets a kit containing the exact same parts. So when you create your robot, it's really difficult because you have to figure out what to prioritize, how to include every member of your team. The team spends six weeks building the robots, and then under the rules, they must bag them and tag them and keep them secured until they're at the competition. So after the six weeks, they kind of have to do a wait and see until this moment. A lot of the teams, especially more of our accomplished teams, they have a strategy session. So they're trying to think about items that they can work on when they have the moment to work on their robot again. A lot of other teams, they also have a prototype robot, which we'll have on the side and they'll make um, adjustments to that prototype, which is not something that they're tagging or competing with but it kind of helps them so they can learn until this moment where they can actually make those adjustments to their robot when they get to the actual regional competition. Jonah is a member of the highly acclaimed team from Stuyvesant High School. Classroom learning, a lot of theory, can never actually add up to 
uh, the experience that you have actually trying to assemble and uh, operate a complex system like a robot. You have to learn how to uh, deal with things that go wrong. You have to learn how to uh, plan for as many contingencies as possible. And you also you get to learn what does work and what doesn't work, all through the context of uh, a competition. A lot of the teams here are from New York City, but we have teams from Florida, we have teams from China, we have teams from um, Turkey, we have teams from Australia. So we have teams throughout the world competing. And while they are competing, there is a certain amount of camaraderie. Teams freely exchange ideas and parts. Friendships made here tend to be beneficial and last. Mike Sereni is a software engineer at SpaceX. I got involved at SpaceX actually through somebody who I met through FIRST Robotics in high school. And competitors say they're learning more than just engineering. It really taught me confidence. You know, I started out as a quiet student in high school, had no idea what I wanted to do. And being able to talk about my ideas and what I want to do with my robot really helped me to grow as a leader. Especially in college right now, I would not have the confidence, like my public speaking abilities without FIRST Robotics. For many of the students taking part in the FIRST competition, they hope that this is a first step in an education and a career in robotics. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. And Jessica is back with one final experiment for us. So Jessica, you're going to take me to the Middle Ages. Yes, I am. So in our book, it's an A to Z book of interesting things and also vile and gross things. And so we, have, we had to have a chapter on bacteria, yep. which actually most bacteria are good for us. Yes, okay. yes. And we have a chapter at the other end of the book, viruses. And yep. actually a lot of viruses are good for us, even though they get a bad rap. However, right now we're going to talk about perhaps a really bad bacterium or a bad virus. Okay. Scientists don't exactly know. So back in the Middle Ages in Europe, there was something called the Black Death. Yes. And it actually wiped out about half the population. And for a long time, we've thought it was actually probably a bacterium in flea-infested rats. Yes, I've read that, yeah. That then mm -hmm. affected mm -hmm. people that, that... and made them horribly sick and they died horrible, horrible deaths. Yes. So some people are actually starting to think maybe it was actually a virus that caused it. So people are kind of figuring that out. Now, something really awful that people used to do back in the day, they were having a lot of wars, there were lots of castles, and one lord would want to take over the castle of sure. the other lord, and they realized that if they took somebody who had died from the plague, put them in a catapult, shot them over the wall of the castle, that could actually spread the plague in that other yeah, which person's is also castle. creepy, but it's essentially early biological warfare. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And so, while we don't want to encourage that sort of behavior, no. <laughs> something really interesting to build is a catapult. A yes. catapult is a really cool and to understand how problem. this was yeah. part of history. Exactly. And so we've got a little um, catapult that kids can build. And actually, I, what I hope is that they'll build this and then they'll innovate to build an even better one yeah. themselves. Yeah. But what you need are eight popsicle sticks. Okay. And so you take six of them and you take some rubber bands and you put a rubber band on this end and a rubber band on that end. Got it. And then you take two more and you basically form a V yes. over them and put a rubber band down where my fingers right. are. You can okay. show everybody this is the yep. one you've already built. And so this is the one I've already built. So yep. we've got our mm -hmm. V there like chopsticks. And then we put um, a spoon here that we can load things in. And today we're going to be launching cotton balls and a small Lego person. Which one would you like to launch first? Oh, well, let's, let's leave the poor Lego guy for All last. All right. Let's give him a Here moment. we go. We're going <laughs> to launch a cotton ball. Okay. Everybody watch out. Woo! Well done. <laughs> well done. All right. Let's try and our very healthy very, Lego guy. Would you like to launch yes. him? Sure, I'll okay, launch him. There we go. Now, did you, you launch I from just, the top? Yep, I'm just holding that down. You can hold this hold down. Hold this part your, down. Yep, ah, there that's you go. a good tip. And then right, let's get him there. Pull right. back on the spoon and. There he bye. goes. <laughs> so, what is this telling us about the way? potentially viruses spread? Well, it's, it's interesting because I sort of think of this catapult in the what happens when we cough or we sneeze yeah, on people. Yeah, exactly. Which is why I'm always encouraging kids to do this yeah. when they cough or sneeze. Um, we, scientists have actually discovered that we all have a little cloud of microorganisms hanging around us at all times. Really? Yeah, it's true. We're kind of like pig pen from yeah. the, the cartoon, the Snoopy cartoon. But um, when we cough or sneeze, we actually spread those even more. And yeah. so, yeah, we don't want to be doing that. Kind of makes you want to wash your hands, huh? It does. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Jessica, this was so fun. You should come back anytime well, because we loved having you. We want to remind everyone that they, these experiments can be done at home, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. And the name of your book? OIC, 
114 yeah. science experiments guaranteed to gross you out. And gross you out, they will. Yes. Right. Thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. Us. In the world of video games, sometimes you need new technology to keep an old kid young at heart. Ari Goldberg visits New York's premier retro gaming store to plug in. Video games have always been for kids, but what happens when the kids grow up? Sure, you can play on modern consoles, but look no further than last year's hottest holiday gift, Nintendo's NES Classic, and you'll see a growing market for retro gaming. Dan Mastin's Video Games New York specializes in the entire history of video games. It's only becoming more apparent that this market is, is back into a growth. I mean, people come from all over the world just to come to our store, but we see even the larger companies getting back into the retro game. You know, and video games has spanned nearly 40 years of technology changes and now it's to the point that now you need to find new ways to be able to interact these older devices with newer technology. Sometimes you can't even connect an old system to modern TVs. Modern sets might not even have the inputs that an old Atari or old Nintendo might need, like the broadcast tuner you used to screw an antenna into, or the familiar red, white, and yellow RCA plugs you'd put a VCR into. And even if you can get it plugged in, you might be barely able to play it anyway. The video game systems when they were programmed back then were for much lower resolution systems commonly used uh, for a while that was standardized 240 pixels um, and that was the the width um, and height you know measurements of it now we're on to thousands and thousands of pixel sizes on these newer televisions so we're taking essentially a very small size picture and we're stretching it to the size of something very large think of how a small photograph gets blurry when you try to zoom in on it essentially that's the problem retro gamers face Modern flat screen TVs are typically 1080p. That high definition is 1080 pixels. Old TVs, and therefore old games, were only meant for 240. So blowing up something so small to fit something so large can make the game look terrible or even unplayable. So how do you make 1981 Atari Pac-Man work on 2017 TVs? One option is to manufacture new game circuitry. Most of the project started as a community-based effort where people that are more technical um, get into this and they start putting together schematics and start building kits that you can actually install in the original hardware to give it new abilities, to give it new qualities, new output methods, um, and enhance the original hardware that you can use with more modern televisions. Another option is called an alternative console where you can pop in games from different systems, Nintendo, Sega, Game Boy, all into a single third-party machine. It's kind of the one system to rule them all. They do multiple games inside of one. It's, it's simple. One controller can play most of these games on your TV without having to, to dance around and find like all these different things to go together. As retro gaming becomes more popular, from fan conventions to showcases on The Tonight Show, you can bet the demand for new technology to save our old technology will only grow. Nostalgia plays a giant role in this, and something that you had this amazing experience with at one point in your life, and you just want to feel that again. And that's something that, you know, video games of every generation might be the right one to give you that feeling again. Modern technology to keep us playing the games of our childhood. For Science and You, I'm Ari Goldberg. And that is our show for today. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. We'll see you next time on Science and You.